Hey guys, this video is going to cover dummy coding and regression, which is a little bit of an unusual topic in the sense that generally if you have categorical IVs and continuous DVs, you will do an ANOVA. But let's say you want to mix and match. We had several categorical IV or categorical IV and a continuous IV, but then also continuous DV. Uh, so you could try ANCOVA or you can go with kind of the more powerful option, which is to use categorical IVs in regression. So what it is, is what dummy coding is, is it's a factorial coding system that creates these pairwise combinations that are used to doing in ANOVA. So when we follow up an ANOVA with post hoc tests, generally we do them two by two, um, meaning like or one against each other. So only two of them at a time. Um, and what dummy coding does is it does that kind of from the start. So actually everything you've done this semester, all of those ANOVAs are just special types of regression with only categorical variables. It's just that um, generally it's easier to do regression or ANOVA analyses if they're all categorical. So I'm gonna do a very simple dummy coding example just so you get the hang of like a, what it, what's happening with a reminder that if you have all categorical IVs, just do ANOVA, it's much easier. Okay. So here's the first note that you need to highlight and make sure you know, because it's on the quiz, how many um, levels are you going to get if you have dummy coded variables? And so it's levels minus one, or you'll need to know this to make the columns especially. So if I have four levels, so this example is from my ANOVA video, so Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, and other, I would only end up having three predictors or sort of three X variables in the regression. And so I have to pick a control group. So see here, I picked Catholic, how it's sort of Catholic versus everybody else. You have to pick a control group. That's like the main point of dummy coding. Um, and that would be the same thing as doing pairwise post hoc T tests from the beginning. So we wouldn't even need to do them at the end. They would just sort of happen naturally as part of the regression output. But what if I wanted Jewish versus other, Jewish versus Protestant and Protestant versus other. So those other pairwise comparisons, I would have to recode those manually to get those comparisons. Sorry, I missed that R thing. Okay. So how do I code variables manually? Let's do that first on this dummy coding data set so that you can see what's going to happen here. Um, and then we'll actually talk about power for a minute, but it helps if you see how it's coded first. So we have this example that I actually used in my ANOVA video as a comparison point here. So we, can, we had three different groups, excellent, fair, and poor health. And we were looking at the number of their friends. And so does the participant's health predict the number of friends they have? So in, in like theory, we have one predictor when it's health, but because it actually has multiple levels, we're gonna have a set of predictors, two. And why is it two? Well, I have three groups, excellent, fair, and poor. So it's gonna be two comparisons um, to start. So it's a multiple linear regression, a simultaneous multilinear regression, meaning I'm doing all the variables at once. And then instead of being one predictor, it's actually two. And that's important for power in regression style analyses to know how many predictors it actually is. So practically it's one, health, but um, mathematically it ends up being two because it's a categorical variable. So I'm gonna go over here to my data set and we're just gonna create those columns. So the way I think about dummy coding is that it's binary. You're creating barcodes for each type of person. Okay? So you can think about this as a, as a barcoding system. Uh, and let's pick a control group. Actually, let's compare everybody to the poor health condition. Because I would think that um, we want to know, as our health gets better, do we get more friends? So let's say everybody versus poor. So for whoever you pick as your control group, they're going to get a barcode of 0, 0. Okay. And it is purposely 0, 0. So I've coded every single person in the poor group was zero, zero. Now this is very easy when I have 11 people. If I had a crap ton of people, you would click data, filter, 
pick the column you're interested in and only pick those participants because then you can kind of switch around. And so what these two columns are, remember I know I have to have two because I have three levels, is they're going to, it's going to use these double zeros to indicate that it is the comparison group. So anybody who has all zeros is comparison. So let's go up a notch and go to fair. And we're just going to make fair 0, 1. Okay. This part doesn't matter quite as much. They still need to be not 0, 0, but we're just going to put a 1 in the first column for them and a 0 in the second column. So they have a unique combination. That's why I said it's kind of like barcodes. 0, 1 is different from 0, 0. Okay. So this is going to be poor versus fair. And how do I know that? Well, if I turn off my filter here, essentially what's happening is I'm comparing that poor group to the fair group because it's the 0, 0 combination versus the 0, 1 combination. Okay. That means this last comparison is poor because it's still our control group versus ex excellent. Okay. And what combination are we going to give them? We're going to do 0 and 1. Now you can switch that, um, and I could have meant excellent 1, 0, and fair 0, 1. That part doesn't matter. Just remember, whoever the 1 is in the column is getting compared to the all zeros. And whoever the 1 is here is compared still to the all zeros. So everything is being compared against uh, poor right now. If I wanted to compare fair to excellent, I would need to recode these two columns where either fair or excellent have all zeros. Okay. So remember, whoever's barcode is all the zeros is our comparison group. And then um, we will use the ones in the columns to figure out who the other group is we're comparing against. Okay. So I'm not going to really cover assumptions in this video. Um, you would test your assumptions on only the continuous variable. Um, I'll do assumptions in the next video. So this we're just focusing on like how does dummy coding work. All right, so I've got that saved. Let's open that in JASP. All right, so I'm gonna click file. Uh, let's see here, computer. This is close enough to here. Go down to regression, pick our dummy code. Okay. And so it's treating these two columns as just two extra variables. Okay. All right, so now that I've got it imported and I've got it worked out, let's come back to power real quick. Okay. So I'm gonna open cheap power. <coughs> it is an F test. And then down here, we're actually going to use a new one. So linear multiple regression, fixed model, R squared deviation from zero. That essentially tests, um, if I bring this down here, so it's using multiple regression because more than one predictor, so it's not correlation. Remember, correlation is one predictor only. Um, R squared deviation from zero says that we're interested in the overall model. So I'm interested if <clears throat> adding any predictors to the equation using any of these is significantly better than using none of them. And that's different from asking the question if adding more predictors is useful. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's pick that. So we're going to go down to linear multiple progression, deviation from zero. Okay. Now to estimate an effect size, sorry, there's not enough room. Okay. So in estimating the effect size, we're going to click determine and then use R square sizes that um, you think might be accurate. So let's see what I did here. We did a large effect in this example. So 0.25. Okay. Um, and you put it here under squared multiple correlation. Okay. Calculate and transfer to main. Alpha is 0.05, beta is always 0.8, and a number of predictors here. It's technically only one. It's group, um, health group they're in, but.
but it actually turns out it ends up being two predictors because it is part of a dummy coded system. So it's two here. So that's why it's always important to know how many predictors you're gonna end up with. So let's hit enter. It says I need 33 people to get at least 80% power with a large effect size. So that's not bad. I certainly only have 11. So we'll see how this works out. It's because right now it's an underpowered study. <clears throat> All right. Um, a write-up example of this would actually look a lot like the ANOVA example. So I don't have a write-up example either. Um, but once you look at the multiple linear regression video, which is the next one in this series, you'll see some examples there of how to work, um, how to write one of these up. Okay, so let's just try it and just. All right, so we're gonna click on regression and then linear regression. Okay. Our dependent variable is friends, so we're predicting the number of friends and look at all the stuff we've already got over here. So we're doing good so far. Um, we've got kind of a lot going on. We're gonna put move over both of our dummy coded variable into covariates here. Leave method as enter. Okay, so you wanna leave that alone. We've got most everything that we need, um, but as you'll see in the next video, if you click on statistics, what you're going to want is R squared change, uh, which in this particular example I don't really actually need, so you can turn it on, look at all the fanciness. Um, descriptives, if you want to see the average scores for each group, but I think that's a little misleading in this particular example, so I'm going to turn that off, but certainly part and partials. And then once we get into the, M, the multiple regression, we're going to talk about how to do our residual statistics and actually the assumption checks. So um, for some reason in the regression window, you get a lot more of the assumptions we're used to doing in Excel. But either way, this is the kind of output we would be looking for. So I'm going to cut and paste this into our Word document here. <clears throat> So do I know if the model is significant? So did we find a significant um, predictor of health predicting friends? So the nice thing about turning on F change is it kind of puts everything right here at the top instead of having to look down here in the ANOVA. So you get ANOVA output in a regression and that tends to confuse people because it doesn't seem like we're doing ANOVA, we're doing regression, but it shows you the uh, sum of squares. And all of that is the same regression and ANOVA, just depending on a couple of little things that we aren't covering in this class. Um, but uh, I think it's a little easier to uh, just look up here. So mainly, these are the numbers we're interested in right here. So F of 2 and 8 is equal to 5.13. Our p-value is equal to 0.04 if I round up. And I want to include R squared. I'm going to make that do the hard work for me. And it's 0.56. Okay. That is double, a little more than double the effect size we actually predicted. So um, our power estimates were so that we didn't have quite enough people. It was kind of low, but we didn't also estimate that particular effect size. So um, you can use R squared change or R squared, you'll notice that they're the same number. And so what does that tell me? That number tells me that the addition of, or even I could say the predictors, which is group health, dummy coded, significantly predicted, don't always love using the word predicted twice in one sentence, but you get the idea, significantly predicted number of friends. So better than chance, we got the number of friends right. If we were guessing at how many they had. But that doesn't really tell me group-wise which one is best. Right. So I actually can come down here. Um, and we want to keep these part and partials. We're going to talk about these part and partials a lot more in the next video. So for right now, let's look at these two things. So we want to know um, which predictor was the best. So you got to think about regression as in that same style as ANOVA. That first you test if the model is significant. And if the model is significant, then you look at the coefficients, which if you think about ANOVA is the same thing, right? We tested if the model was significant and then we did post hoc tests. Same vein. 
So what we would do is we would say the poor versus fair combination. Um, this is the unstandardized B value, and it should look very familiar. I know you've all slept since you watched that first ANOVA video, but that's actually that mean difference between the poor versus fair average scores. And let me prove that to you. Um, so remember, we had to cheat before to get means from, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, from groups uh, in our ANOVA. But let's just run that as an ANOVA real quick. <clears throat> and then I want descriptives. So check it out. Look at that F value. It's 5.13. That P value is the same. So this is the exact same ANOVA as the one we just ran in regression. And the um, comparisons here are poor versus fair. 5.33 minus 1.5 is this 3.83. So the unstandardized B value is actually the mean difference. But really here we're interested in T. Well, what are the degrees of freedom right here? We're so used to having them right next to it. It's actually the residual degrees of freedom. It's the eight from up here. Okay, in either place, they're the same thing. So we'll say eight. Okay. And that equals 3.20. Our p-value is, hitting the wrong keys. Our p-value is um, 0.01. Now, if we did poor versus excellent, it is not significant. <clears throat> if I can find the right numbers here, 1.35, our p-value is 0.21. And that mostly matches what we found in our post hoc test when we did this as an ANOVA. Um, but remember that when you click on the post hoc test option here, it's including a correction. So it's giving that mean difference, fair to poor, but see how the p-value is 0.03, right? So you see the t-value is 3.2, it's exactly the same. The p-value is 0.03, here it's 0.01. Well, that's because in the, the post hocs for ANOVA, you're doing a type 1 error correction. Here, as part of regression, you don't end up having that. Now, that's the trickiest part about this. Let's say I did want to get fair versus excellent. I would need to recode everything and then control for type 1 error in a like sort of separate manual way. So this is one reason people don't like dummy coding in regression unless they just have to is because it's a lot more work than ANOVA. I know you guys think ANOVA is a lot of work, but this would be a, in addition to all the normal steps for regression. But if you are interested in mixing and matching variables, we have categorical variables and continuous variables, and maybe you want the interaction, you have to go this dummy coding route. So I wanted to show you how it worked, um, because to me, it allows you some more flexibility in your analyses where you don't have to separate IVs out into categorical and not. All right, so what I'm gonna do in the next video is we're gonna talk about multiple linear regression, which you've already just done by watching this video. Uh, we'll talk about all those assumptions, those tricky uh, assumption things, but also what do, um, what, what effect sizes can I use here? Because we used Cohen's D before, so what do I use now? And that's where part and partials come in. Um, and then how to interpret categorical, I'm sorry, continuous predictors in multiple regression versus these categorical ones, which are the mean difference between groups. Uh, when they're coded, paired against each other. Okay, so stay tuned for the next video on multiple linear regression, this time with um, continuous variables.